How many know that everyone has their own BS in this room? Some of you got all offended. I'm like, oh, you know you say worse stuff than that. How many know that we all carry our own BS everywhere we go? You carry it at home. You carry it at work. You carry it at the mall. You carry it wherever you go. Every single one of us have our own BS. Look at your neighbor and say, what's your BS? What's your belief system? Let me say that again. What's some you y'all you're, you're twisted, man. Y'all are dirty. You should have seen what the ADM church thought it was at the what what BS. They gave me some weird definition. I'm like, what the? I'm like y'all perverted, man. What's wrong with you? You know what I'm saying? Everybody say belief system. We all have our own belief system, whether you're a Christian or a non-Christian. You have your belief system. And how many know that your belief system creates your behavior? And your behavior begins to create a cycle. And your cycles can become vicious cycles. And so every single one of us right now, including moi, is carrying a belief system in how I do life. And how I do marriage. And how I do church. And how I do whatever. Just like you have a belief system in how you do everything that you're doing right now. You are who you are because of what you believe, not what you do. It's what you believe and then you do, amen? And so we got to talk about this belief system because I hear people all the time say some very cool, clever stuff that is really just weird. Like I hear some stuff that's like not even biblically true. We're talking about dangerous theology. That's a negative and it's a positive because how many know that the gospel of Jesus Christ, it is dangerous because it will change your life. But it's also dangerous when you and I don't understand our theology, when we don't understand God's word, then we are uh, 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 we're, we're, we can literally be, tr- be trapped by the enemy to, to be deceived. And how many know that the, that the worst deception is the self-deception that we have sometimes? Like that can become the most crazy deception it's not even what the devil does it's what we believe that can be so confusing so you hear really cool stuff like have you ever heard things like this like live out your truth or how about this one you know uh do what your heart tells you how many have ever heard that one just do what your heart tell what your heart telling you right now my heart's telling me i want a cheeseburger you know i don't know we we just like or, or how about this one Follow your heart. Like, like, yeah, follow your heart, but isn't it your heart that got you in all kinds of trouble? Isn't it your heart that has led you to some very stupid decisions? Hello? Yeah, follow your heart. Do what your heart tells you. Do, do you. No, don't you. Do, don't do you. Amen? So, because here, here's why. Because... We, we fail to understand that our truth can be twisted. Our truth can be the trap that keeps leading you down the same path of destruction. And we know that the thief comes to steal, kill, destroy. But listen, don't get it twisted. Don't give the devil too much, you know, juice. Don't give him too much applause. Like, let's come back to being responsible with what you believe, knowing that God has already given us a manual. He's giving us his word. He's given us something that we can, that we can stand on firmly. The Bible does, says when you've done all to stand, you keep standing therefore, because it's therefore God's going to do something amazing in your life. So you can't get, I don't care how cute it sounds. Listen, just because you're hearing me preach on this pulpit, or the people that you listen to online, or the podcast, don't be fooled. I'm hearing more and more crazy stuff from the pulpit than I've ever heard before. Like just weird stuff. It's not even biblical. I mean, it rhymes. It sounds good. Like even when I hear some of the stuff I hear from preachers, because I I listen to see what's being preached out there. I kind of pay attention to what's the pulse. But man, it's almost like it's disgusting, the stuff I'm hearing today. It really is. It's drawn away from this. It's drawn away from God. 
And that's not what God wants from us. He wants us to know the truth. Jesus said, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So if you're not free, it's because you're lacking truth. Every one of us right now, you have some BS. All of us do. But what is that BS you're dealing with? Are you hearing me? Yeah. And there's, a, there's such a major epidemic right now in the body of Christ. There is spiritual illiteracy all over the body of Christ. Most Christians can't explain to you the gospel. Most Christians can't explain to you their faith. I mean, they have, they have ears. We all have ears to hear. But how many know that in Revelations, when you look at the scripture, the Bible says that my church has ears to hear, but they're not really hearing. And, and so just because you have ears, just because everybody's sitting in this room, let me tell you something. There's only a certain percentage that is getting these messages and that is actually having fruit from the messages. Only a few, a few percentage. It's statistic and it sucks, but there is such an illiteracy. You cannot just trust what people say or what you hear. You have to take what God brings to you through the preachers, right, through the teachers, through the pastors, but then you have to do your due diligence and put in the hard work and find out, does this really line up with God's word? Or is it just tickling, is it just tickling my ears? I mean, you can have sermons that are tickled me, Elmo. You have to. You have to, listen, you have to check in for yourself. You have to examine yourself whether or not this is true. And we got to know the word. Listen, theology is simply this. Theology, the word theology alone, it just means the study of God's word. But I'm not preaching to you about the study of God's word. I'm preaching to you about Christian theology. Okay, because Christian theology is knowing God through Jesus Christ. It's about knowing him personally. It's about knowing him intimately, right? It's about knowing Jesus for real. It's not I get to Jesus through my church or I get to Jesus through the leadership or I get to Jesus through that sermon. No, I get to through, through Jesus. I get to Jesus through his word. I get through G, to Jesus through my relationship. I get, I get to Jesus through my, my, my passion for knowing him. And that's how we connect with God. And so Christian theology is knowing God, but it's through Jesus Christ. Say that with me. That's how I know God. It's through Jesus. And if you've been told, and I, listen, there's a lot of crazy stuff out there, but if you've been told that God won't lead you through, ever say through, and that's a, key, that's a key word here, if God won't lead you through difficult situations, you've been lied to. There's so many people that think that just because you become Christian that God is going to protect you from ever experiencing another obstacle. That just because you're a Christian that you're never going to find another challenge or be troubled in your marriage, be troubled in your parenting, be troubled in your emotional stability, be troubled in work, be troubled at home. Like if you think that just because you're a Christian that you're not going to have pain and suffering, you've been lied to. There is pain and suffering on this earth. And you know what sucks is that sometimes we will fall victim to it. But it doesn't mean that you have to live as a victim the rest of your life. Because that's where, listen, that's where Satan will come and get you to believe a truth that is twisted. And that's what we're talking about today. But I've also seen people that have been told that living for God leads to the, the path of least resistance. Heck, I've been walking with God for 23 years. Listen, it was resistant just getting to church today. No, life is not a path of butterflies. Life is not a path of just amazingness and, and God's going to do all the desires of my heart. No, he's not. Because most of our desires, they don't even line up with God. I've heard people tell me, God hasn't given me the desires of my heart. I'm like, dude, I, I can just see your behavior and your attitude. No wonder he ain't giving you the desires of your heart. Because they, they don't line up with his. And that's where it gets twisted. We'll take a verse like that and we'll twist it and we'll bend God to our truth. You'll bend them. You'll twist them. You'll, you'll start having your own theology. And you'll start thinking that just be God, because God is not giving you what you desire, then he must not be God. That is classic for Satan to twist your desires. 
my desires. God's desire is that you know him. That's his greatest desire. Is that your desire? So I've been, I've, I've, I've had people say, well, you know, why is there so, so much resistance? Like, like it's so hard. Yeah, because you know what? It's worth it. When you sacrifice for something, it's because it's worth it. It's worth the sacrifice. If you have no sacrifice as a Christian, maybe what he did on the cross for you and me wasn't really worth it. My sacrifice places a value on Jesus. But it also places a value on my life. Amen? Once again, Jesus said, you'll know the truth. You'll know the truth, and the truth will what? It'll, it, one version says set you free, but the original version says it'll make you free. It'll make you. I know it'll make you. You know why? Jesus said, follow me, and I'll make you. See, so Jesus wants to make something out of you. Amen? There's one thing to set, and there's a whole other level when God makes something out of you. God wants to make you prosperous. God wants to make you whole. God wants to make you healed. God wants to make you full of joy. God wants to make you be just like him. That's what God wants to make. Why would he even say, and you shall know the truth? Here's why. Because God already knew that there was a liar on the earth, and the Bible describes him or defines Satan as the father of all lies. He's the father of lies. But also in the Bible says, and God is the father of truth. And so please don't get it twisted thinking that just because I'm a Christian that I'm never going to be lied to. Or that just because I'm a Christian, I'm never going to be betrayed. Or just because I'm a Christian, I'm never going to experience an obstacle again in my life. No, lie, lie, lie. You are going to be betrayed. You are going to be hurt. You are going to be talked about. You will have challenges. You will have trouble. You will, but be of good cheer because Jesus said, but I have overcome this world. That's the good news of the gospel right there. All right, Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 says this. It says, the Holy Spirit, I'm sorry, who? Check this out. The Holy Spirit led Jesus into the desert. And there, everybody say, and there. And there the devil tempted him. Think about it. Jesus himself was led by the Spirit of God into the desert. We know that if you've been a Christian for a minute, when someone says, man, I feel like I'm in the desert, it means that you're dry, you're spiritually dry. It means that you're in a place of maybe confusion. You're in a place of just complete drought. It just feels like, man, nothing's happening for you. Isn't that amazing how God's Spirit led his son into that place? Because think about it. How good is having the word if the word hasn't been tested. Example, my friend bought a nice Porsche 911, brand spanking new. And he's like, my, my car, 0 to 60, 2.2 seconds. I'm like, what? 2.2? He's like, and he just kept raving about his Porsche. And he started talking about how fast it went, how sleek, how it handled, how the, tr like, he's like, he's selling me on this. Like straight up, and then you know what he says? He's like, he's like, you want to try? <laughs> he's like, here, take my car. I'm like, well, well, I'm going to take that car. And let me tell you something. I took that car, zero to 60 in 2.2 seconds. <laughs> it's the most amazing thing. And then I said, Lord, give me the desires of my heart. <laughs> <laughs> He hasn't given it to me yet. <laughs> no, no, listen, listen. Look at this. Let me, let me explain it to you. Look, look. It's, it's, it's funny because he's, he's expressing all these, these words. And he's trying to convince me that, that a Porsche 911 that he has can do 0 to 60 in 2.2 seconds. And, and I'm hearing him, but how many know that, that it wasn't as real for me until he gave me the keys and I took that bad boy for a test drive? Once I took that bad boy for a test, I'm like, whoa, it does go 0 to 62.2 seconds. Well, let me tell you what God said about you and me. Let me tell you what Jesus said. Matthew chapter 16, verse 19. Matthew 16, verse 19 says this. Look at this. And I will give you the? Peace. Come on, stay with me. And I will give you the? Peace. Of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on this earth will be loosed in heaven. 
It's amazing how God has given you the keys to his word, the keys to his kingdom, but we're not test driving it. It's just information. We're just listening to the gospel every, okay, I wonder what pastor's going to bring us this week. My question is, I wonder what you're going to bring in this week. I wonder what you're bringing. What healing are you bringing? What restoration are you bringing to work? What transformation are you bringing home? What revelation are you bringing to your children? Or are we just a babysitting center here for you? Our children's ministry is not a babysitting center. It is a life-changing ministry that is wrecking your kids for normal. A kingdom normal, amen? Where they actually pray, say, Mom, why are you, why are you eating that pizza? You haven't prayed yet. Oh, Mom, sorry, honey. No, they're, 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 there's a conviction. Something's happening inside of them. There's a transformation that's happening. God's saying, I have given you the keys to my kingdom. And why aren't you test driving my word? Okay, go back to Mark chapter 4. Remember the story of, of Jesus at, at, when, when he was led by the Holy Spirit? Do you guys remember that? Okay, why was he led there? Here's why. Because Jesus, listen, Jesus didn't need to prove himself. Jesus knew he was the word. Think about this. He was led to this place to be tempted. Okay, well, he was tested, but Satan was tempting while he was being tested. Kind of like your taxes right now. You can be tempted. You're sitting there doing your taxes, and the tax guy says, hey, man, you know, just, let's just claim a few more kids. And you, you, you get, like, this much more money. For, for, okay. And you put down 12. <laughs> But you have no kids. Like it's just one year. The IRS will miss it. You know, right? You're, you're being tempted because, listen, because Satan comes to tempt the testing. You're either going to pass the test or you'll be tempted to cheat. Are you hearing me? So Jesus puts himself in our predicament. And he is being tempted by God to be an example and a model of how to confront the, opposi the opposition and the forces of darkness that are going to come to steal his truth from you. Listen, there's only three areas Satan's going to come for us. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Those are the three areas that Satan comes for. How do I know that? You read the story in Mark chapter 4 where Jesus is in the desert. Right? He's hungry. He's fasting and he's praying. He's seeking the face of God. And what does Satan do? He shows, so, shows up right when Jesus was starving. Let me tell you something. Jesus may have been starving in the flesh, meaning physical food, but he was not starving in the spirit. The church is starving spiritually, but is obese physically. Are you hearing me? And so he tells Jesus, Satan comes in and says, hey, he says, look at all this. And he shows them the kingdoms of the earth. He says, I'll give it all to you if you just bow down to me. How many of us are bowing down to Satan's lies? He says, I'll give, I'll give it all to you. And Jesus said to him, what? You shall not tempt the Lord your God. There's only one God, and he's a jealous God. See, some of us, we still have idols. God's saying, you see, we need to go ahead and kick the cow over and know that there's only one true God. He says, there's only one God and only one we worship, and his name is Jesus. Then he knows that he's hungry, and he says, hey, look, he sees rocks. He says, you see, look at this rock. If you are the son of God, see, he's tempting who he is. He's tempting his identity. He says, if, this, if you're the son of God, if you say who you say you are, See, you stop proving yourself to people. Just be God's daughter, be God's son, and stop proving yourself. Too many of us want to prove everybody wrong. I'll show them. I was poor. I'll show them I'll be rich. Get over yourself. That's being arrogant and prideful. You're no different than the liar. Just do what you're going to do, and just let the works do the talking. Amen? And so he says, turn this rock into bread. If you're this. He says, you know what? Here's the deal. He's like saying, man shall not live by what? Bread alone. But by what? Every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. He's saying, listen, 
I know that you guys need to eat. It's important. We have to feed our body. But God was focused on, but you got to feed your spirit, man. And the word is the only thing that, that can nourish you spiritually so that you can not only overcome the troubles, overcome the challenges, overcome the emotional pain and suffering. God's word is the only thing that can fuel you to overcome everything on the path of resistance. But you know what our path, our resistance has been more resistance of God and more embracing of Satan's lies. That's why he says in James, resist the devil. Well, let's start it. Let's say it this way. Let's start the, the first verse that everybody forgets. Submit to God. Yeah. <laughs> the reason people don't get free is because they, they refuse to submit. Why? They resist. He says, submit to God. Resist the devil and he will. So why, is, why aren't these lies fleeing? Why isn't this, this, this torment fleeing? I'll tell you why. Because we have a submit issue. So submit to God. Yield yourself to God. Trust God. Are you hearing me today? And so he's saying, I'm giving you the keys to my kingdom. David understood opposition. When you look at the story of David, David was a young kid. He shows up on the battlefield. He shows up on the, on, on, on the, on the, at the valley of trouble. The children of Israel are facing the greatest opposition. His name is Goliath. Everybody say Goliath. Okay, that, that Goliath, was opposing God's people. That Goliath was opposing God's freedom. That Goliath was opposing God's people's destiny. That Goliath was opposing God's restoration, reconciliation, transformation. And then a young boy named David shows up on the scene and he sees the opposition that is happening towards God's people. Now, David shows up and he knew he was a child. As a matter of fact, the people themselves were telling him, what are you doing here, little boy? See, the first place that the enemy was trying to use people was to try to confront the identity of who David was based on his age. Some of us have allowed the enemy to oppose us based on our color, based on our creed, based on our pedigree, based on our age based on whether or not you're educated, based on whether or not you are someone who has been skillfully developed. How many know that God can take someone who is completely messed up, get the word inside of them, and then revolutionize their life? Yeah. All right? He can do it. That's what he did with me. I got no education. Yeah. Yeah, I got the word inside of me, but I'm also someone that applies myself a lot. Okay? So he shows up on the scene. And, and you know what David starts thinking? Because I'm sure that David wasn't just this cocky little kid that showed up, which I know that he was very proud, but he was proud in his faith. And he shows up on the scene. And they keep trying to tell him what he's not. But I'm glad that he had an experience, an encounter, a revelation of the living God. So much that he said this. He said, hey, listen, guys, here's the deal. The God who was with me in the land when I had to face the bear and when I had to face the lion is the same God that helped me overcome that is the one that's going to help me overcome this. See, so often the reason there is no change is because we're not willing to face the giant and stop looking at the outward giant. You know where the major giant is? It's the giant inside of you. The outward giant likes to point the finger, not to deny that people hurt us, not to deny that people betray us, not to deny that people do hurtful and harmful things to us. But at some point, you got to be responsible for you. At some point, you got to be responsible for who you are in Christ Jesus. And he said, you know what? The same God that helped me face the lying and the bear is the same God that's going to help me face this Goliath. And we know that he didn't come with all kinds of weaponry. We know that his weapons were simple, five little smooth rocks, right? But notice that he didn't make it about the rocks. He was just looking. I'm sure he was just looking for any rocks, just any first five rocks he can find, right? I mean, he was doing the works part. He was doing his part. But his faith was not in the weapon. His faith was not in the rocks. His faith was in the Almighty God. How do I know that? When he came up and faced his Goliath, he said, hey, listen, you come to me with a javelin, a sword, and all kinds of weapons. I don't come to you with all that stuff. He said, I'm facing you. I am coming against you in the name 
of the Lord my God. There's a big difference on how you face opposition. See, Goliath was opposing the truth. What was the truth? That God had a plan for the Israelites. What was the lie? The lie was that the Israelites started having their BS, their belief system, hinder their breakthrough. So David understood, he had a personal revelation that because of my knowing God, because of my intimacy with God, I know that the same God who got me out of that mess is the same God that's going to get me out of this situation. And so often we find ourselves in situations in this lifetime where we can become so stuck with the opposition that we cannot move forward. Listen, you're one truth away from your deliverance. You're one truth away, and that truth is called the Holy Spirit. Bible. It's God's word. It is living and it's active and you're either going to trust God and take his word and lean in on his word and stand on his word or you're just going to keep being illiterate in the place that you're in right now. I give you the keys. Listen, it's not the truth that, that, that you can quote. I know so many of us can quote scripture here. I know that's not good enough. You can quote all the scripture you want. Do you think the devil cares about how much scripture you can quote? He don't give a rip. You know what he gets, you know what he gets scared about? When you believe what you quote. When you believe what you quote, man, it's dangerous for him. Because now he knows that nothing is going to move you. Nothing is going to shake you. You are standing on that word of God. You are living out that word of God. It's not just what you can quote. It's not even the truth that you know mentally. Because there are a lot of people that are very intelligent, very smart. But how many know that intelligence and smartness, it, it can't trump faith. It can't. I know some very intellectual people that know a lot of theology. But here's the truth. I look at their theology. They can probably break down the word of God. But my problem that I'm seeing with so many people that can do that, but they don't know how to, they don't know how to see the fruit from it. And God wants us to bear fruit from his word. God wants us to do something amazing with this. But it's the truth that you're living out right now is what guides the rest of your life. I hope I'm talking to someone today. 8 a.m. was lit. You guys are a little quiet. Is deep. Let me get you some floaties real quick. Give me a sec. I, just, I don't want you to drown. It's so deep. <laughs> Listen, when you look at what Satan did with Jesus, it's pretty hilarious how Satan would have the audacity <laughs> to try or to think that he can oppose Jesus, the word with the word. Like how stupid, that's how stupid saying is. Like how do you go and try to tempt the word <laughs> with the word? Because Satan was, Satan was quoting scripture. Throw yourself off this cliff and watch the angels catch you lest you dash your foot against the stone. That's what's in the book of Psalms. Satan was quoting the word. How do you oppose the word with the word? You got to be, that's how, that's, that's our opponent. And we, and we fall for it. We fall for it. And, and listen, I'm not better than you. I have fallen for lies as much as you. Yeah, me too. Did ever say hashtag me too? We should hashtag that today, right? All of us have. He knew the word of God because he was the word of God. John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God and the word was God. How do you, you got to be stupid to be, you, but Jesus was showing you and me that we also have the power and the ability to oppose Satan and all his lies with his word. That's why in every verse, and we did do that for homework tonight. Let's see if you do. In every verse, if you see it, when he was being tempted by the tempter, he said, it is written. It is written. It is written. 
Jesus quoted the word. You can listen, you can get mad, upset, angry at God. You can do all those things. And let me ask you something. How's that helping you? It's not helping you. It's not even changing your life. You're getting deeper into your cycle. You're getting deeper into your darkness. But how many know that light will break forth in all darkness? And this word is light. And without this light, we will remain in darkness. And you can have the belief system that Satan has already created inside of you, or you can go ahead and debunk it with God's word. Open the Bible and start seeing what God says about your situation and not what you think or believe about your situation. Are you here? Look at your neighbor again and say, what's your BS? Listen, Satan knows that our theology is the key to our success. Let me prove it to you and let's get out of here. Joshua 1.8. It says, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it how many times? Day and night. That's hard to do. You know why? Because it requires work. It requires you and I taking time to open our Bible and to actually read it. It takes time. And most people stop reading the word because they all have the same line. I don't understand the Bible. So what do you do? So I don't read it. Okay, so you don't understand the Bible, but you want to understand God, but you won't read his Bible. How twisted is that? I'm not making fun of anybody. Is that twisted? I'm just saying, I'm just saying this. Because I remember when I first started going to church, I would hear my pastor speak or any preacher, and I'm like, what the heck are they saying? You know, like it was so deep. It was. Someone was like, what the? So God's whacking who now? What? Who's he killing now? Who's he taking out? Like, you'd be like, man, I'm serving like a gangster. You know what I'm saying? Like, he's just killing everybody, man. And then he drowns you, and then he throws you inside of a fish. And like, what the? Right? Anybody ever feel like that? Like, what the heck's he talking? Have you ever thought like that about me? Like, what's he talking about? But this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate it in it day and night that you may observe to do everybody say to do see it's not just what you know it's what you do with what you know to do according to all that is written in it for then every say then, then. and only then only say it again then, then. and only then. only then you will make you will what make. you will what make you will make and you will bake your way prosperous, and then, and only then, you will have good success. How many want to be prosperous, amen? And that doesn't, I know some of you just went to money like, yes, dollar sign, jing, jing, jing. No, prosperous in soul, prosperous in spirit, prosperous in faith, prosperous in love, prosperous in generosity, prosperous in being someone who serves God, prosperous. I serve Jesus, therefore I prosper. I meditate on Jesus. Listen, you don't have to read your Bible all day. But you know what you can do? You can hide a few little scriptures in your pocket. Call your phone. Pull that bad boy out during lunch, breakfast, and just read through three verses a day. After you've already read your word, right? Find it whether it's morning. I don't care. There's all these preachers out there. You have to read it. In the, read it when you got time. That's when you read it. You think God cares about the quantity? No, God cares about the quality of your relationship. That's what he wants. Do we have a relationship? That's what I want. I want a relationship with you. And you just go throughout the day. Because how many know that Satan doesn't come for you? He comes for what's inside of you. That's why the Bible says, greater is he that lives in me than he that's in the world. Y'all tired yet? Y'all want to go home now? <laughs> Last one, that's it. Okay, I promise you now. We'll get out of here early today. This is it. 11.10. We'll be done 11.15. Deal? Time me. Here we go. <laughs> you would too, Pastor Anthony, huh? Okay. Think about this. Let's look at the story in Genesis in the beginning. Because, listen, Satan comes for what's in you. What do I mean by that? Genesis 
chapter 3, verse 1 through 11. It says the serpent. Let me say the serpent. Okay, I know that in church you don't hear no more about the devil anymore. You don't hear that. And you know why? Because it's not popular and you may lose people. We don't care. You, you must know the truth, okay? The serpent from the beginning, look, was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. And one day he asked the woman. Who asked the woman? Satan, the serpent. He asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat the fruit from my, uh, uh, fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Of course we may eat fruit from the trees of the, in the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. And God said, you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will. You won't die. Look at this, look at this. You won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be open as soon as you eat it, and it'll be just like God, knowing both good and evil. And the woman was what? Convinced. And the woman was what? Convinced. See, Satan doesn't come for you. God, listen, Satan cares less about you as a person. He comes for the relationship inside of you. That he'll convince you that his lie is greater than God's truth. He'll convince you that Goliath is bigger. He'll convince you that Goliath is greater. He'll convince you that Goliath will conquer you. She was convinced you you allow the enemy to talk to you long enough, you'll be convinced of your own truth, which is really a lie. And only you know what your truth is. Because you all got your own BS just as much as I got my own BS. So she took some of the fruit and she ate it. And then she gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it too. And that moment their eyes were open and they suddenly felt what? Shame. Isn't that what lies make us feel? Shame. At their nakedness, so they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves when, they, uh, when the cool evening breezes were blowing. And the man and his wife heard the Lord. They heard what? They heard the what? The Lord what? Walking about. That means that every day God was walking through the garden. Every day he was checking up on them. How you doing, son? How you doing? daughter how you doing right just loving on everybody just touching just feeling just just like how you doing just every day just walking in the garden just wanting to connect with you just a little bit more wanting to expose himself intimacy into me see he wanted you to see God his love his forgiveness his grace his mercy his plan his future the hope of glory that's what God's doing with you sir and he was walking about in the garden. So they what? They what? They did what? They hid themselves. They hid themselves. So many of us probably struggle with God because you keep hiding with the shame you live with. Shame does not lead you closer to God. Shame keeps you in the place of hiding from God. Hiding from truth. The truth walked into the garden. When the truth walks into the garden, there is no shame. So they hid from the Lord God among the trees. And then the Lord God called to the man, where are you? Everybody say, where are you? Where are you? The, he replied, I, I, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was what? I was afraid because I was naked. Who told you that you were naked? Who told you that lie? I didn't create you to be filled with shame. I didn't create you to be filled with condemnation. I created you to be free. Amen. Because who the sun sets free is free indeed. And so maybe you're here today and maybe you're hiding with shame. Maybe you're bound with shame. Maybe you're hiding from God's truth. He says, who told you that? Have you eaten from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? Was that my last verse? Thank you. Let me tell you something. There's two things God is asking you today. Where are you? Where are you? 
Where are you, Elevate Church? Where? The second thing, once you define where you're at, he said, now who told you that? Who told you you were no good? Who told you that life was over? Who told you that depression is the rest and the, 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 it's the rest of the days? Who told you that? Who told you you'll never be happy? Who told you you won't find my joy? Who told you you'll be broke for the rest of life? Who told you that? Where are you? Bow your head, close your eyes. Where are you? Where are you at right now? Father, I, I pray for all of us, every single one of us in this room. I'm asking you, Lord, by the Holy Spirit to be led through this next season in 2020 of our life to be able to find the path of resistance but no longer seeing it as a negative but knowing that you, Jesus, you walk us through it. You walk us through the pain. You walk us through the suffering. You walk us through the trouble. You walk us through the challenges. We will not hide. We will trust you. We will believe you. Our faith and trust is in you, Jesus, no matter what. Father, today we come to the conclusion it's not about what I heard. It's about what you said. And you say you love them. You have a plan for them. You have a purpose for them. You have healing for them. You have deliverance for them. You have deliverance for us. You have freedom for us. Come on, just lift your hands to heaven and just say, Lord, I receive that freedom. Come on, just repent, Lord, forgive me for the lies I've been chewing on. Forgive me, Lord, for the lies I've made my belief. No, I choose your truth, your word. It's not my theology. It's what you said in your word. It's what I'll believe. It's what I'll stand on. It's what I'll live by. It's what I'll trust. It's your word. Your word brings life. It's not what man said. I'm not going to keep blaming others. I'm going to stop pointing the finger. And I'm going to be responsible with my life. Because my life is yours. In Jesus' name.